that good Monday morning. Hope you, hopefully you had a good weekend. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, we're going to finish the book this week. Uh, if that causes you any grief, then uh, get over it. Go find yourself some more Mitch album and read some Mitch album books. They're all good. When we finished Friday, it was a cliffhanger. Marguerite had gotten into an accident. And uh, what up with that? Love like rain can nourish from above, drenching couples with a soaking joy. But sometimes, under the angry heat of life, love dries on the surface and must nourish from below, tending to its roots, keeping itself alive. The accident on Leicester Street sent Marguerite to the hospital. She was confined to bed rest for nearly six months. Her injured liver recovered eventually, but the expense and the delay cost them the adoption. The unspoken blame for this never found a resting place. It simply moved like a shadow from husband to wife. Marguerite went quiet for a long time. Eddie lost himself in work. The shadow took a place at their table and they ate in its presence amid the lonely clanking of forks and plates. When they spoke, they spoke of small things. The water of their love was hidden beneath the roots. Eddie never bet the horses again. His visits with Noel came to a gradual end, each of them unable to discuss much over breakfast that didn't feel like an effort. An amusement park in California introduced the first tubular steel tracks. They twisted at severe angles, unachievable with wood, and suddenly roller coasters, which had faded to near oblivion, were back in fashion. Mr. Bullock, the park owner, had ordered a steel track model for Ruby Pier, and Eddie oversaw the construction. He barked at the installers, checking every, every one of their moves. He didn't trust anything this fast. 60 degree, degree angles? He was sure someone would get hurt. Anyhow, it gave him a distraction. The Stardust band shell was torn down, so was the zipper ride and the tunnel of love, which kids found too corny now. A few years later, a new boat ride called the Log Flume was constructed, and to Eddie's surprise, it was hugely popular. The riders floated through troughs of water and dropped at the end into a large splash pool. Eddie couldn't figure why people so loved getting wet when the ocean was 300 yards away, but he maintained it just the same working shoeless in the water, ensuring the boats never loosened from the tracks. In time, husband and wife began talking again, and one night, Eddie even spoke about adopting. Marguerite rubbed her forehead and said, Too old now. Eddie said, What's too old for a child? The years passed, and while a child never came, their wounds slowly healed and their companionship rose to fill the space they were saving for another. In the morning, she made him toast and coffee, and he dropped her at her cleaning job, then drove back to the pier. Sometimes in the afternoon, she got off early and walked the boardwalk with him, following his rounds, riding carousel horses or uh, yellow painted clamshells as Eddie explained the rotors and cables and listened for the engine's hum. One July evening, they found themselves walking by the ocean, eating great popsicles, their bare feet sinking in the wet sand. They looked around and realized they were the oldest people on the beach. That is going to happen to you someday. Just be ready. Marguerite said something about bikini bathing suits the young girls were wearing and how she would never have the nerve to wear such a thing. And Eddie said the girls were lucky because if she did, the men would not look at anyone else. And even though by this point Marguerite was in her mid-40s and her hips had thickened and a web of small lines had formed at her eyes, she thanked Eddie gratefully and looked at his crooked nose and wide jaw. 
The waters of their love fell again from above and soaked them as surely as the sea that gathered at their feet. Three years later, she was breading chicken cutlets in the kitchen of their apartment, the one they'd kept all this time, long after Eddie's mother had died, because Marguerite said it reminded her of when they were kids, and, and she liked to see the old carousel out the window. Suddenly, without warning, the fingers of her right hand stretched open uncontrollably. They moved backward. They would not close. The cutlet slid from her palm. It fell into the sink. Her arm throbbed. Her breathing quickened. She stared at the, at the, she, excuse me, she stared for a moment at the hand with those locked fingers that appeared to belong to someone else, someone gripping a large invisible jar. And then everything went dizzy. Eddie, she called, but by the time he arrived, she'd passed out on the floor. It was, they would determine, a tumor on the brain, and her decline would be like many others, treatments that made the disease seem mild, hair falling out in patches, mornings spent with noisy radiation machines, and evenings spent vomiting into a hospital toilet. In the final days when cancer was ruled the victor, the doctors said only, rest, take it easy. And when she asked questions, they nodded sympathetically as if their nods were medicine doled out with a dropper. She realized this was protocol, their way of being nice while being helpless. And when one of them suggested getting your affairs in order, she asked to be released from the hospital. But she told them more than asked. Eddie helped her up the stairs and hung her coat as she looked around the apartment. She wanted to cook, but he made her sit and he heated some water for tea. He had purchased lamb chops the day before and that night he bumbled through a dinner with several invited guests and co-workers, most of whom greeted Marguerite and her sallow complexion with sentences like, well, look who's back, as if it were a homecoming and not a farewell party. They ate mashed potatoes from a corningware dish and had butterscotch brownies for dessert. And when Marguerite finished a second glass of wine, Eddie took the bottle and poured her a third. Two days later, she awoke with a scream. He drove her to the hospital in the pre-dawn silence. They spoke in short sentences what doctor might be on, who Eddie should call. And even though she was sitting in the seat next to him, Eddie felt her in everything, in the steering wheel, in the gas pedal, in the blinking of his eye, in the clearing of his throat. Every move he made was about hanging on to her. She was 47. You have the card, she asked him. The card, he said blankly. She drew a deep breath and closed her eyes, and her voice was thinner when she resumed speaking as if that breath had cost her dearly. Insurance, she croaked. Yeah, yeah, he said quickly. I got the card. They parked in the lot, and Eddie shut the engine. It was suddenly too still and too quiet. He heard every tiny sound, the squeak of his body on the leather seat, the kunk of the door handle, the rush of the outside air, his feet on the pavement, the jangle of his keys. He opened her door and helped her get out. Her shoulders were scrunched up near her jaws like a freezing child. Her hair blew across her face. She sniffed and lifted her eyes to the horizon. She motioned to Eddie and nodded toward the distant top of a big white amusement ride with red carts dangling like ornaments. You can see it from here, she said. The Ferris wheel, he said. She looked away, home. Because he had not slept in heaven, it was Eddie's perception that he'd not spent more than a few hours with any of the people he'd met. And then again, without night or day, without sleeping or waking, without sunsets or high tide, <coughs> excuse me, or meals or schedules, <coughs> excuse me, how did he know? With Marguerite, he only wanted more time, more and more time, and he was granted it night times and day times and night times again. They walked through the doors of the assorted weddings and spoke of everything he wished to speak about. 
at a Swedish ceremony, Eddie told her about his brother Joe, who died 10 years earlier from a heart attack, just a month after purchasing a new co condominium in Florida. At a Russian ceremony, she asked if he'd kept the old apartment, and he said that he had, and she said she was glad. At an outdoor ceremony in a Lebanese village, he spoke about what had happened to him here in heaven, and she seemed to listen and to know at the same time. He spoke of the blue man and his story, why some die when others live, and he spoke about the captain and his tale of sacrifice, and when he spoke about his father, Marguerite recalled the many nights he'd spent enraged at the man, confounded by his silence. And he told her he'd made things square, and her eyebrows lifted, and her lips spread, and Eddie felt an old, warm feeling he'd missed for years, the simple act of making his wife happy. One night, Eddie spoke about the changes at Ruby Pier, how the old rides had been torn down, how the penny whistle music at the arcade was now blaring rock and roll, how the roller coasters now had corkscrew twists and carts that hung down from the tracks, and how the dark rides, which once meant cowboy cutouts and glow paint, were full of video screens like watching television all the time. He told her the new names, no more dippers or tumble bugs. Everything was the blizzard, the mind bender, Top Gun, the vortex. Sounds strange, don't it, Eddie said. It sounds, she said wistfully, like someone else's summer. Eddie realized that was precisely what he'd been feeling for years. I should have worked somewhere else, he told her. I should have never, I should have, I should, I'm sorry I never got us out of there. My dad, my leg, I always felt like such a bum after the war. He saw sadness pass over her face. What happened, she asked, during the war? He never quite told her. It was all understood. Soldiers in his day did what they had to do and didn't speak of it once they came home. He thought about men he'd killed. He thought about the guards. He thought about the blood on his hands. He wondered if he'd ever be forgiven. I lost myself, she said. He said, no, his wife said. Yes, he whispered, and she said nothing else. At times there in heaven, the two of them would lie down together, but they did not sleep. On earth, Marguerite said, when you fell asleep, you sometimes dreamed your heaven, and those dreams helped to form it, but there was no reason for such dreams now. Instead, Eddie held her shoulders and nuzzled her hair and took long, deep breaths. And at one point, he asked his wife if God knew he was there, and she smiled and said, of course. And even when Eddie admitted that some of his life he'd spent hiding from God, and the rest of the time he thought he went unnoticed. So, Mrs. Gusky says something uh, that I remember when I read this passage every time. And that's about love can nourish from above and... Um, husbands and wives and my wife said to me one time that uh, anyone can be married when they're happy and things are okay um, hi puppy dog um, but it's when things are are not okay and when things are difficult that it's the reason for this and that is why for the ring the ring is not for when things are excited and happy as for when things are sad, like with Eddie and Marguerite. Have a great day.